Absolutely. And I think embracing the whole of who you are is so important in this type of situation because there's no, uh, let me, let me think about it. So something I say all the time and something I've written about a lot is human is the only move left in internet business. So for a while you could kind of fake it and have like your brand persona and then your real life. And it just doesn't track anymore. And so having to show up with the wholeness of who you are is how you're attracting people. And I think that you're exactly right. Like they, they they're attracted to you because of that. And because you really get this experience, which they are probably experiencing or have experienced. Welcome to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast where micropreneurs building genuine lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. I'm your host, Candice Rodardi, and today I'm joined by Rachel Allen. As the owner of Bolt from the Blue Copywriting, Rachel is a firm believer in being stupid lucky in her business. Despite facing setbacks, she has embraced this mindset, which has greatly influenced her approach to running her company and forming meaningful relationships. Rachel combines the power of neuroscience and the art of exceptional writing to help businesses generate revenue through their words and strategies. Her ultimate mission is to transform great ideas into reality by crafting the perfect words. With her expertise, Rachel enables businesses to unleash their full potential, expanding their income, impact, and influence. Welcome, Rachel. Thank about- you so much. I'm excited to be here. We're going to have one of my favorite conversations because it's the thing that I suck at most. <laughs> copywriting. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us your story. How did you get to where you are today? Uh, you know, I fell actually completely backwards into it. I would have never in a billion years have thought that I would become a copywriter, mostly because I didn't know that it was a job that existed. Um, I went to school for journalism and, uh, I minored in Mandarin. So I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to maybe like work for the economist, like commenting on Asian politics, that kind of thing. I was really fascinated by it. And then I graduated in 2008 and the economy completely fell apart. And of course, nobody was hiring anybody, but especially not journalism majors from rural Tennessee. So I uh, sent out 200 resumes and I got zero responses. And I ended up being able to pick up a warehouse job at Old Navy on the 5 a.m. shift. And I was like, oh, this is this is not what I have planned for my life. So I stuck that out for about six months. And then I was like, you know what? what they have jobs in Hong Kong. Cause of course I'm 22 at the time. And I'm like, yeah, that's, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to I'm going to like go, I'm just going to go. Cause it's as far away from Tennessee as I can possibly conceive of. So I went except uh, to get a job there. You have to have this pain in the ass piece of paper called a work visa, which I did not get before I left. And I landed there with about $200 in my bank account and I had to make rent. And so I'm like Googling like how to make money online because it's 2008 and that's what you did. And I saw this job and they're like, oh, it's, it's a thing called copywriting. It was a freelance position, like with a content mill. And I was like, what? It, what? I, I mean, I guess I'll give it a try. And then 15 years later, here I am running a copywriting agency. So how long did you end up living in Hong Kong? About two years. And what brought you back? Uh, well, I kind of, I was actually a digital nomad for 10 years. So I lived in Hong Kong for about two years and then was in uh, the UK and then Greece and kind of like popped around Europe um, and a couple of other places. And then about 10 years later, came back to DC uh, and then have now have since sort of been moving around the States as well. So you're in, you're in the DC area now? Uh, now I'm actually back in Tennessee of all places. <laughs> Isn't that funny how we end up, always end up back home? Yeah. Well, sometimes you end up back at your husband's home, but <laughs> people always want to go home. Yeah. Um, so our, our mutual friend, Liz Scully, is also a virtual nomad. So um, I can see why we're, she's our virtual friend because you are yeah, our yeah. mutual friend because you um, you have lived a similar lifestyle traveling around the around the world. That's exciting. Uh, mm-hmm. And what I love about what you did is you created a business for yourself so that you could have that lifestyle. Yeah, I love it. I love it. So let's talk about being stupid lucky. What does that mean? Yeah. Oh, that's one of it's one of my favorite things. So I um I have had some incredible breaks in business. I know the narrative is like I I you know pulled myself up by my bootstraps and I tightened my belt and I hustled and I'm like I mean yeah kind of and also I have had some incredibly lucky breaks like people who believed in me before they really had any right to um, business opportunities that have come my way even my background in education I had um, a really really in depth high quality education that allowed me to kind of jump in and um, be better at this than I would have otherwise so. 
so that's what that means to me. I've had these things where like through absolutely no, uh, you know, fault of my own or no, nothing that I have done to deserve it. I have had things happen to me that have been incredibly lucky. And I, I talk about this all the time. And I think it's important to talk about in business because it's disingenuous to be like, oh no, I got here all on my own steam. It's all just because I'm like so excellent and I'm such a hard worker. Those things are true. And also I have had some incredible luck. So I'm, what I'm hearing is that it's not necessarily luck. It's that you put yourself in the right position. I mean, it wasn't lucky that you went to college. You went to college. You just, it wasn't lucky that you made the right connections. You made those connections. This is true. And I will say some of the connections I made, um, you know, I, again, I think the narrative is like, you go out and you network and you meet the right people. I was just talking to people. I mean, some of my very best clients, some of my highest paying clients, we were just bullshitting on Twitter. And then I was like, oh, wait, you're fancy. Ah, Look at that. And then it just kind of worked out, (laughs) you know, but you were talking to them. Yeah. You took action and you were talking to them. Mm I want, I, I, I agree with the stupid lucky thing. Just if you think you're lucky, you are lucky. Yeah. Like if you think something's easy, it is easy. If you think it's hard, it's hard, right? Absolutely. This is easy. You know, I, I, well, lately I keep telling myself that something I'm, I'm, wor- I'm working on a little side project and I just keep telling everybody how easy it is. Mm-hmm. And it is easy because mm-hmm. I keep telling people how easy it is. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. um, um, so go, go back to lucky. Yeah. You have to, sometimes you have to, Um, I, and I get what you're saying about, I didn't pull up my bootstraps, but, but you did put yourself in the position to be lucky. This is true. Like you can't yeah. win the lottery if you don't buy a ticket. Absolutely. Yeah, no, this is true. And um, I think part of it too, is just the, the persistence of continuing to go down that road because, you know, one of my, my very first client, I signed for five figures, which does not happen, you know, in the entrepreneur world. And the way that that worked out was I was working for content mills and my job there was to write meta descriptions. You know, a little paragraph that pops up on Google. So they were paying me 65 cents per meta description. And I would do that for a couple hours a day and be really fast at it. So I could earn enough to like be okay. And then in my spare time, I was learning everything I could about entrepreneurship and I like built a really bad website on WordPress. And um, I was like showing up in Facebook groups. And then randomly somebody was like, Hey, have you heard of Rachel Allen? They mentioned me to this other lady who happened to run a very important business in a small Facebook group. And then she was like, Oh, no, I haven't. Look at that. And that's how that came about. But it was, uh, it was very unexpected. Yeah. But, but then your mindset is all of my clients are five figure clients. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, starting out like having that as the bar for the first one really does make a difference. Well, it's like a real estate agents who are selling hundred thousand dollar homes. Well, you're only going to sell hundred thousand dollar homes. You want to sell the million dollar homes, put yourself in a position so that you meet the people who are going to sell their million dollar home. Yeah. You know, I have a, I have a friend who her first, she, she became a real estate agent and her very first, she went from being a Mary Kay consultant to being a real estate agent. And her very oh, wow. first, her very first listing was $600,000. <laughs> She's like, okay, well, all of your listings are going to be over half a million and above. That's mm-hmm. it. You're not, never, don't ever take one lower than that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, yep. you know, you are a half a million and above real estate agent. Um, and it really, it is a, it, it is a mindset, but it's putting yourself in, in the position to be lucky to get that listing. To, mm-hmm. to be lucky to get that client, mm-hmm. but you're in, you have to put yourself in the position. Absolutely, and you can't and you win the to... lottery if you don't buy a lot of ticket. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, and you have to follow through on it too, which is something that I've seen. I've been seeing um, a lot actually in the entrepreneur world. We go through phases with this, as I'm sure you've seen as well. But people will like you know, swing for these major contracts and they'll get them. And then they'll be like, oh well, like I just couldn't, like I just didn't, or like they don't show up and they don't follow through. And I'm like, ah, oh, then why did you try that opportunity? Yeah, yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. You figure out a way to do it. Even if it means that yeah. you have to hire some part-time help to get you get it done. Exactly. Wow. That's yeah, what am I, I go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say there's a poem that I have somewhere around here, but there's a line in it and it says the gods will give you chances, know them. And I'm like, yeah, like take that chance, go for it. Mm-hmm. I just recently sent a greeting card to my clients. Ah. <laughs> and they all got this, um, I sort of stapled it to something else, but they all got this yeah. thing to make their own. Lo- it's the lollipop is the yes and sign. Uh-huh. And then you cut it out and you put it on the, on, you tape it to your pencil yourself. Um, uh-huh. But yeah, so I just sent it all to them and said, do this, pop it out, put it on your life and start saying yes and to every opportunity. Because oh, the yes, that. the yes part is easy. It's the and. Mm-hmm. It's the and. So um, yeah, I'm totally on board with that. All right. Let's talk about this really interesting thing called neuroscience of communication. Yes. Um, 
do we have to be neuroscientists to write well? <laughs> no, you definitely don't. Um, but really all you have to be is human and the, the neuroscience. So I actually, um, I have a book coming out where I talk about both sides of this. I talk about the science and the art of communication, and really it's just two views on the same thing. So focusing on the science part, cause that's where we're talking about right now. All of these things happen in your own brain as well, right? I can explain to you all of the neuroscientific things that happen and like why our brains uh, encounter communication the way they do. And I can talk to you all about the really cool, like nerdy things that are like going on in my brain while I'm talking to you. But what you really have to know about it is you're a human. You know what it's like to have a good conversation with somebody. And you know what it's like when somebody's like bullshitting you or faking it or just awkward. And so the neuroscience is really just the the underlying explanation for all of these things that we instinctually feel and know. We live in this world right now where people are so fake. Mm. They are so, so fake and t- people are tired of the fake. Yeah, I don't want to see it anymore. I mean, I don't, I don't know how reality TV shows are still a thing because it's all BS. Mm-hmm. You know, people want authenticity. Mm-hmm. So, you know, one of the things I do to be authentic is you know, everybody loves my pink wig, but (laughs) sometimes I have to remind people that there's a bald head underneath that. (laughs) So I will post pictures of myself drinking a smoothie to social media just because, you know, you got to be, you got to be raw and real. Now, am I a copywriter? No. Is the copy that accompanies (laughs) that picture good? No. (laughs) But didn't we talk earlier about if you say something, it becomes true. I am an Mm -hmm. awesome copywriter. I get better at my copywriting every day. There you go. And honestly, you're probably better than you think. People get very caught up in this and they think like, oh, my copy doesn't look like whoever like you idolized in the early internet days. I don't write like Ash Amberjay used to write, or I don't like write like Kendrick Shope or Marie Forleo or whoever, you know, whoever your person was. But you know what? Marie Forleo isn't writing her own copy. No, of course not. She is absolutely Neither is Gary Vee. Yeah. Uh, Something that I have come to grips with recently, very recently, although it's something I always struggled with, I've been struggling with it for 10 years. Uh, ever since social media became a thing. So how long has that been? 15 years, <laughs> yeah. right? Is that I am a to the point, bullet point person, mm-hmm. right? I think in bullet points, I take notes in bullet points and I write in bullet points. And I tried mm-hmm. not to be a bullet point writer. I tried mm-hmm. to listen to the gurus who told me that I had to have these 5,000 word oh, blog yeah. posts. And that's just not who I am. Mm-hmm. And so in the last year, in the last six months, starting in January, I went on a project where I, I, I'm i going to do every day, five days a week, I write a blog post, right? Nice. So, that, I mean, it's a project for the whole year. I'm going to get the whole year done, five posts a, a week for the whole year. I, I have um, gone back to my high school roots where I write five paragraph essays <laughs> for my blog posts. Intro, yeah. three points, conclusion. Yeah. And that's because that is how I write. And yeah. I don't I don't read more than that either. If I'm going to consume somebody's content, if it's longer than five paragraphs, I probably won't read it. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to be my best target client and I'm going to provide the content, create the content that me as my best client would want to consume. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have thoughts on that? Because sometimes you're not your best client. Yeah. So I think that's, that was my first thought of like, that is excellent. If your clients also read like that, which you know them of course, better than anybody. So yeah, great. And um, what it really makes me think of though, is I love that, that, that you're taking that approach because so often we're taught to be like, no, but like write for your clients and think about them as the first step. And I'm like, absolutely not. If you do that, you'll be chasing trends forever. It's like trying to mind read in a relationship. You have to know yourself and your message first before you can effectively inflect that message in such a way that the other people can get it. So I love that you're starting with that clarity on who you are and how you think. And now that like the only possible tweak would be if your audience happens to be something wildly different, then of course you can change it up. But I think it's great. And I think that the authenticity in that speaks for itself. When you, I mean, as a copywriter, you're working with people who have a different approach than you do, but I'm a coach. Yeah. Right. And so people are attracted to me because of my story Mm -hmm. and the people who are attracted to my story usually have a similar story. Yeah. So why would I try to attract it? It's okay. I'm going to get raw and real. And uh, this is something I've also been struggling with this year. Well, is this Candace's therapy session? I'm sorry. Maybe. That's okay. Y'all, I'm here for it. Geek, the Gratitude Geek episode today is brought by Candace's Therapy. <laughs> <laughs> you would be actually honestly shocked how often this happens in copywriting. <laughs> it's very personal. <laughs> uh, um, the top three blog posts on my website all have to do with breast cancer. Yeah. And the top three videos on my YouTube channel 
aren't the same topics, but they are also breast cancer related. Mm -hmm. And I had, when I started this project of five blog posts a week, it was so that I could teach Google that my (laughs) website wasn't about breast cancer. It was about business coaching, accountability right. coaching. And so I wrote a whole crap load of articles about accountability, how to, how to be accountable. I did this whole thing on Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Mm. I mean, I did this whole thing. So it's July. We're re- interviewing this in July. So that is six months of content about accountability and motivation. Mm. And my top three blog posts are still about ble- bre- breast, <laughs> breast cancer. And my top three YouTube videos are still about breast cancer. Mm. And so I just decided that you know what? I can be an accountability coach for people who have cancer. Yeah. Right. I can, I can embrace that. That's what Google wants because that's obviously what my audience is. I mean, they're attracted to me because of my cancer story. So why not embrace it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think embracing the whole of who you are is so important in this type of situation because there's no, let me, let me think about it for you. So something I say all the time and something I've written about a lot is human is the only move left in internet business. So for a while you could kind of fake it and have like your brand persona and then your real life. And it just doesn't track anymore. And so having to show up with the wholeness of who you are is how you're attracting people. And I think that you're exactly right. Like they, they are attracted to you because of that. And because you really get this experience, which they're probably experiencing or have experienced. Exactly. Okay. So now I'm thinking about Sasha Fierce, who is yeah. Beyonce's uh alternate ego that she puts on when she performs yeah um but that's not who she really is mm. you know so they're mm-hmm. they're oh, there's it, just weighing that whole authentic authentic versus what the what the audience sees and i i mean how yeah. exhausting must it must it be for her oh to yeah. have to transform into somebody else so that she could perform and she has a whole team supporting her in that. Whereas most of us, you know, hanging out on Instagram by ourselves, do not have an entire team supporting you to put on your, like your entrepreneur Barbie face, you know? Yeah. Oh, oh, gag me. I used yeah. to, I used to get really annoyed by coaches that made videos with bright red lipstick. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, I would call them lipstick coaches. And usually <laughs> they were half my age and I'm like, okay, how, what life experience could that lipstick coach possibly have? Does this, <laughs> does this make me sound snarky? Probably. <laughs> But, um, but, you know, they're just doing the best that they can with the limited ex- experience that they have. And at that point, you know, we're, I'm talking 10 years ago at that point, that was all they saw. Yeah. They thought that they had to do that to attract people to be their, the, their client when mm-hmm. really now we're done. We are so done. Yeah. So yeah. in your copywriting, <laughs> don't do it either. My, oh, yeah. fa- my favorite, um, I follow a guy named Welly Mula on LinkedIn and I get his emails and he is one of the only people that I read every email he writes. Mm. He spells all his words wrong on purpose. <laughs> he infuses everything he writes with his personality. He, and uh, he has a, um, he has a, a, a mail email service. His business is called bird send and it's, it's an email service provider for coaches. Oh. So he has built an entire platform for um, mailing list platform around coaches and what coaches need. Mm-hmm. Uh, so he, I mean, he's, his message is always on purpose, but I love it. He always spells money, M A H N E Y. <laughs> right. He, uh, he, and he just always infuses everything with authenticity instead of being mm. perfect. He be, he's real. Right. And I mm. think that that's where we're heading. Yeah. All right. So as a copywriter, who's talking to an audience of B2B of um, a B2B, who's talking to an audience of DIY marketers, because most of yeah. the folks listening to the show are DIY marketers. Yeah. How do we do that? So the first thing, and this is the, it sounds so simple and I think it's very, uh, it can be very emotionally hard is just to really commit to what you actually have and how you actually feel. You have to know yourself or you have to at least be willing to, to kind of be in the same room with yourself when you're writing, as opposed to thinking like, oh, well, how do I put my entrepreneur Barbie face on and then make it sound like marketing, which is just, it's didn't, you're going to follow every trend. It will lead you to disaster. So the first thing is to just be really, really honest, like you were about like who you are, how you write and what you really want out of the interaction. Everything after that, the technical stuff, the, the ways that we can play with words, all of the things we can do with structures and headlines and whatnot, the strategy, that's just icing on the top. What really gives it that oomph and that like bottled lightning feeling is you. And that is the one resource that like you cannot, nobody else can do that except you. And so I think um, that's, that's the first and most important thing. And then of course, there's loads of things we can do on top of that, but it's just realizing that whatever your deal is, you got to write from that. Yeah. Yeah. Be, 
be 100% who you are. Mm -hmm. Don't try to be fake, especially now. There's so many fake people. Yeah. Well, and that's where we see people getting into like worst case scenario, the very, very, um, shall we say complicated scenarios. Like we saw a bunch of very big name coaches go through this a couple of years ago where they would have a message that they had very carefully crafted. And then it would be very tone deaf or it would um, have, you know, accidentally, maybe not accidentally racist overtones or comparisons. And they're like, no, but like, that's my authentic self. And I'm like, no, that's what you thought your audience was going to buy. And then you really did not run it through anybody who would tell you no. And then they, when all of that fallout happened, they didn't know how to just show up and be like, well, that sucked. I'm sorry. I was wrong. Yeah. It had to be like, I apologize if you were offended by my unintentional, non-offensive, da 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 you know? Yeah. We can tell the fakiness in that. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, racism is selling lately. Yeah. And in 2023, racism is a really hot. I recently saw a statistic that said that 60% of parents would rather their child tell them they're a Nazi than than that they were part of the LGBTQ community. Wow. 60% said, I'd rather my kid be a Nazi than Mm. gay. Some crazy numbers. Yeah. uh, Some crazy numbers. So we're in a weird place right now. (laughs) Yeah, very much so. (laughs) I I am hoping that this trend is just a trend. you you back to what you said before tracing chasing trends yeah you tra- you don't need to trace tra- tra- <laughs> you don't need to chase trends when you're authentic yeah and what's so funny about that and you know i've um i've had a lot of people talk to me about, about chat gpt lately because of course and you and i of were talking about have, threads yeah. right before we got on yeah and people are like oh but do i need to do you know i need to like buy a course to learn how to do threads or i need to buy a course to learn how to do whatever and i'm like does anybody remember periscope how about clubhouse <laughs> do we remember these things so you know people come to me and i'm like this is my fourth internet apocalypse you know all of these dude bro marketers are like pack it up the internet's done go home yeah I'm like man, I've been doing this since 2008. Like we've been through this. It's yeah. all a trend. And what's fascinating if you approach it with authenticity is that you will eventually have your turn in the spotlight where your authenticity is the flavor of the day. And then everybody's like, oh my God, you're so great. Yeah. And I'm like, I've been doing this forever. I can't not, it's, it's all I got, man. I have been digital marketing since 1999. Oof. And here's what I know, 1999. So that's 24 years. SEO is still the king. Mm. a queen she's still the queen seo is still the queen <laughs> you can get on all the socials you want but if your blog doesn't pre- or if your website doesn't doesn't present you as a person that they want to do business with because they're going to google you they're yeah. going to find you on social and then they're going to google you mm-hmm. so seo is still the queen I, I think seo is a woman yeah i could see that i could definitely see that we and i also oh go ahead well i was gonna say we could we could make the avatar the seo avatar who is she <laughs> What is she like? <laughs> what kind of car does she drive? <laughs> I know, but it changes like every two seconds. That's, that's the true. thing. That's, that's why she's complicated. <laughs> oh, maybe that's why she's a woman. Yeah. Understandable. <laughs> anyway, what were you going to say? Oh, no, I just, I, um, I think it is so important. And also what I recommend for my clients to do is, is think about the level of SEO that matches where you're at in business right now. Because we've all seen those people who like, they've been in business six months and they're trying to buy some like massive course to get first page rankings. It's, that's not what you need. You know, you just need to understand how to match it to the level that you're at right now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, you do want to be at, on the first page, but not necessarily for the keyword that you think that it needs to yeah. be. And yeah, I yeah. build an entire successful, highly successful business off of a series of keywords that were very niche mm-hmm. that a v- very few handful of people actually wanted, but I dominated those keywords mm-hmm. uh, because, but I knew who my, my audience was. I knew, yeah. who, I knew who, I knew who I was selling to. And that's um, the key. Yeah. And people would always ask me, well, how did you get movie stars to buy from you? How do they find you? Because I'm using the right keyword strategy yeah. to get them to come to my website. Yeah. You know, how does how you know I, I know I know what they're shopping for. I know exactly what they want to see and I know what they, you know, what what their outcome is. I know how they want to be treated. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like if I got if I it I my husband was a handcrafted custom he handcrafted. Mm. My husband was a, a custom furniture maker. He made mm-hmm. he made king size beds for antique furniture collectors. Mm -hmm. So um, we worked with a lot of movie stars and and country Western stars and fortune 500 executives, people who knew exactly what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And we gave them exactly what they wanted. They wanted a bed, a king size bed that matched 
their colonial furniture that they had yeah. been collecting. You know, they they had spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on these antiques and they wanted a bed that went with the with that furniture. Right. And we knew exactly how to market it and how to sell it. And I knew how to talk to them when they called me. Mm-hmm. Which is you know. so important. And I think that that like the the point that I really want to draw out there is that you didn't try to go for the the keyword of beds or even no. custom beds. No, I'm sure it was much more specific. Than oh, that. yeah. Oh, yeah. We I would go with color. I mean, we, we would have the same bed in 12 different colors. And yeah. each one of those beds in the 12 different colors had a description because the colors it wasn't it wasn't that it was a blue bed. It was that it was a bed for your beach house. Right. Right. It wasn't that it was a black bed. It was a bed for your colonial home. Right. right. So I didn't describe the bed. I described where the bed would live. Mm-hmm. And that's what people were looking for. Mm-hmm. I just gave you guys my my uh, search engine optimization secrets for selling <laughs> custom furniture. <laughs> But I love that you talk about that though, because that's what the neuroscience stuff really comes down to. You know, I think we're, we're taught to do the client avatar thing of, you know, they're, they're a woman between the ages of 35 and 45 and they like Captain Crunch for breakfast and they have a dog and they live in the suburbs. And I'm like, yeah, you've just made yourself a really nice little paper doll. What you really need to know is exactly what you did. Like what, what are they thinking? How do they think? What world do they live in, in their head? And then how can you talk to that? Yeah. I, I, the Captain Crunch for, Crunch for Breakfast and all that is not important. But to me, I needed to, what kind of car do they drive, right? Yeah. Because if you understand what kind of car they drive, you understand how they feel about fuel economy. If you right. understand how they f- feel about fuel economy, you understand how they feel about um, conservation. And, mm-hmm. and you know, so my mark, my antique collectors usually drove electric cars or very highly fuel efficient cars because they were uh, conscientious of their carbon footprint. And right. so we were conscientious of our carbon footprint. And we were very clear that we, you know, we used recycled packing materials. We only bought FSC for uh, certified wood. You know, we were, you know, we, we had our statement. This is how we feel about the, the uh, environment because we knew that they felt the same way. And so we right. wanted to match, but it wasn't just, it wasn't just because our clients wanted it. It was because we wanted it too. Exactly. I mean, we, we saw the waste. We yeah. would literally drive around to all the furniture stores in our in our community and we would take their waste and we would oh. use it to repack. And then sometimes people would call and say, was this bed made in China? And we we're like, no, nope, we just recycled the box. <laughs> we just recycled the box. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because all that waste, you know, we took we took their garbage that they mm-hmm. were going to throw away and we turned it around and we used it to pack our furniture. Mm-hmm. But, you know, it, and, and of course it probably ended up in the dumpster at that point, but you got one more use at least it got one more use out of it, you know, yeah, but yeah. we knew that that was going to be important to our, so our, our whole message was for that avatar, mm-hmm. but we didn't care if they ate Captain Crunch for breakfast. <laughs> exactly. And I think that you really pulled it out of all these things. They're just indicators. Like you can know what kind of car they drive, but it doesn't, that's not the end. That's just the sign. Yeah. Exactly. The reason why they drive that car is because of this. Yeah. You know, this ma- this major point. So I do believe in, in creating an avatar, but to your point, I don't think we need to know they eat Captain Crunch. Yeah. Or you- if they do, is it some sort of like, what does it mean about them? You know, if you can't answer the question, what does this mean? Then your avatar is useless. Well, okay. So let's build an avatar to, because this is a good, exp- um, a good exercise. Um, let's pick a product. Um, well, you're a copywriter. Mm-hmm. Um, how do we pick a product? <laughs> it could be anything. That's the thing. The um, existential crisis. Come up with one. Um, let's do a service because a lot of people listening are service providers. So okay. how about- and a lot of your, yeah. What's, what are your clients or in, and listeners normally sell? Are they service-based coaches? Like, what do we do? They're, they're, well, they're, they have so many different, you know, when you're a solopreneur doing your own marketing, there's so many different things you could be doing, but right. probably a lot of them are network marketing. Okay. So uh, let's yeah. pick a network marketing company that sells, um, gloves. Let's just pick Ooh. gloves. Okay. They okay. sell, they sell gloves. All right. right. So you are an affiliate with a network marketing. Just imagine you are an affiliate with a network marketing company and your product that you sell is a highly specialized glove. Ooh, excellent. Okay. So the first thing I want to know is what is, what is the specialization of the glove and what does it do? Because then that's going to tell me who's going to buy it and why. Ooh. Okay. They're for washing the dishes. Oh, excellent. Okay. So then we can go, My, I'm already like branching in 5,000 different directions. Is it for uh, people who have very sensitive skin conditions and they can't, yes. you know, they can't do that. Okay. Yes. So then the the thing they need to feel so is one of those safe. yes and moments. Exactly. <laughs> I like it. It's like improv, uh, improv client avataring. Yeah. <laughs> 
So the main thing they need to feel is safe because yeah. everything in the world makes their skin irritated and unhappy. And they have probably tried out a whole bunch of different products and maybe spent a lot of money on it. And they may have people in their lives who are like, oh, come on, like really, you can't even wash the dishes without your special gloves. So they need to know that their experience is valid and that you are there to act as that protective barrier, literally between them and the things that make them uncomfortable. So that's the main psychological need you would have to address in the copy. Now, do I care that they wash their, the dishes with uh, Dawn versus uh, seventh generation? Maybe that might tell me some things about them. That's useful information because that indicates to me their, where their other like desires lie. Do I care what they're washing off the plate? Probably not. You know, that does not matter to me. If they have, let's say, I don't know, maybe they only ever use very fine China, maybe useful. There's lots of different ways that we can go in here, but I, I hope this can kind of illustrate for the listeners, like the whole thing is just an exercise in curiosity. It's like, okay, why do you do this? And how do you feel when you're doing it? Oh, I, 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 now my brain is going in. When you said fine China, my brain went in a whole different direction Yeah, because with fine China, you kind of have to wash it by hand. Right. Exactly. So and if you you're wanna, already having skin conditions, then. So you want to take care of your skin while you're taking care of your fine China. People exactly. with fine China, it's usually handed down to them too. Exactly. I mean, I don't know a lot of people who buy brand new fine China. It's usually not so much. Yeah. yeah it's my grandmother's or yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. This could, you could really go on and on and on with this. And all mm -hmm. we did was start with gloves. Yeah. And I think if we're just going to like put a bow on it, it's take as good care of your skin as you take care of your China. Like they are both a both legacy. There we go. Done and done. Boom. <laughs> Boom. So listener, if you want to do this same process, take it, you start with something really basic and just keep yes. Anding it. Just keep, mm -hmm. quiet, you know, uh, oh, it's beautiful. I, I love it. I love it. I love it. And right, so, I, okay. uh, sorry, not to talk across you, but just to give you your listeners another sort of useful heuristic, um, a thing that I tell my clients to think about a lot is as in sales copy, but it works here too, is how do they need to feel and what do they need to know before they can say yes to buying your thing? So that's kind of the, the, the questions that can get you started with this. How do they need to feel and what do they need to know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the feel part comes first. Everybody wants to go with no, because they're like, well, our gloves are made out of something, something material. That's really, no one cares about that. Yeah. There's a really great quote from um, David Hyatt. He wrote an article called 10 lessons from a maker. And one of them is that nobody goes to sleep at night and dreams of high quality, which is absolutely true. They're yeah. not going to dream of your, you know, special, whatever material gloves. They're going to dream of their hands, not hurting. My husband and I have, well, okay. It's me. I got it. I'm, I'm going to fully take responsibility for this. I am very frugal. Mm. And so I have never invested in very expensive sheets mm. up until recently. And I will never spend, I will never be cheap on sheets again. They make such a difference because I sleep better in these. And I think maybe it, for me, it was always the price point and it mm -hmm. never was that you'll sleep better. Yeah. Like if, if somebody had told me how much better I'll sleep with these, you know, I don't know, even know, 8,000 count thread, thread, thread count mm -hmm. Egyptian cotton or, or actually these were not Egyptian cotton. They were another kind of cotton, but you know, but, but if somebody had said that you'll sleep better, I would have been, okay, that's worth spending twice as much on those sheets. Yeah. You know? Um, but yeah, it's because I never thought I was always price-based because yeah. no one had taken the time to sell me on the benefits of sheets. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think that's so important for your listeners as well. If, if people aren't buying, it might, it's almost always not because of the price. It's because you haven't explained to them how to care about this thing yet. Yeah. Yeah. And that's coming from a woman who spent a lot of her time over the course of 15 years trying to figure out the language and the images and the, the overall copy and the conversation around selling luxury beds to antique furniture collectors. <laughs> and I'm the one who was too cheap to buy the sheets. <laughs> we all have those things though. <laughs> I love it. I, I, I want to, we, we don't have much time left. So I want to dig into what you learned by living around as a, t a woman from Southern Tennessee, who's lived in all over the world. Mm -hmm. What are some of the life lessons that you learned by being Ooh, a world traveler? I think the primary one is you just like, so people ask me all the time, how did you do that? How did you do that? And I'm like, well, I bought a ticket and then I got on the plane and that's kind of the thing. And I think it's easy to get wrapped up ahead of time in um, what I call contingency planning eternity of like, yeah, but well, if I do this and then this happens, then what? And, no, 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 no. and I can do that 
forever. But ultimately the best things that have ever happened to me is because I went in with that yes and, and I was like, well, I don't know, but I'm going to figure it out. And I don't mean this in the careless, like, I'm just going to fling myself into the universe and it will take care of me because that's a dumb way to do life. But I think it's to have confidence in your own capacity and realize that you can figure just about anything out. Now, it might be ridiculously unpleasant and terribly uncomfortable until you do, but ultimately you can do it. Well, and they were asking how, but the Mm -hmm. question wasn't how, you know, tell me the steps. Yeah. It was the, how do I do it too? How can I yeah. change my mindset? Um, yeah. And which is, goes back to that whole thing that we were talking about, you know, half an hour ago about the neuroscience of communication there, they couldn't get past the, how do I, you know, they know how to buy a ticket, but they didn't know yeah. how to get on the plane. Exactly. They didn't know how to dream big enough to go live someplace else. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. Uh, and granted, I don't have any interest in living in Hong Kong, so it's mm-hmm. not for everybody. Right. Yeah. Your dream doesn't have to be somebody else's dream. Your dream is your own dream. Yeah, but, but whatever it is, you can do it. Exactly. Exactly. Just say yes. Mm-hmm. Say yes. Say yes to possibilities and say yes to options. I I think that found that the more I say yes, the more um the more wonderful and the more lucky I get. Yeah. You know, no, I say yes. Absolutely. I, you know, it's like oh, wow, this was a really lucky thing that happened to me. I mm-hmm. say yes to something that sucked. Well, I was really lucky that I went through that experience because now I know what not to say yes to. Yeah, exactly. I'm right? like, there are some things I will never, ever, ever do again. And I've learned that very decisively. But yeah. I think the the little yeses with the no, the no expectation of return, like I have one of my favorite long-term clients. Um, she and I have worked for, together forever. And um, she working with her has led me to work with like very bigger clients and to present at WDS and to do all of these things that people try to kind of like reverse engineer their way into. And it was literally because she posted something on her blog way back when, and I made like a little gif of a t-shirt with a, an image from that blog. And it was like, this is dumb. Look at it. And she was like, oh, that's awesome. We should talk, you know? <laughs> so what's WDS? Uh, World Domination Summit, uh, Chris Gillibo's thing that he used to do in Portland. You know what? I think I know someone else who spoke at World Domination Summit. I'll have to look that up. 10 years. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I taught a workshop, so I I wasn't on the main stage or anything, but I did actually get a client of mine on the main stage. I wrote a pitch that got him up there. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, So what are the, what a lot of folks listening might also want to be speakers. So what is your number Mm. one tip for writing a pitch that will get you on a stage? Um, The authenticity thing and get the punchline right up front. Because people are reading these pitches so fast that there needs to be something that hooks them right, uh, like just right away. And here's the the magic part. You have to make sure that your pitch hooks into whatever they're looking for. So read the instructions on their pitches, uh, pitch instructions very carefully, and then take your story and just inflect it in such a way that it ties in to that. So like, I'm actually applying for TED, uh, TEDx talks right now, and they all have different themes. And I say the same thing over and over and over again. I just talk about words, but I like one of the themes was awaken. And then I was like, oh yes, words awaken us to whatever. So you just have to show them that you get what they're doing and then you can do whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. Well, as long as you're, well, I'm, I'm not a TEDx expert. I just, I know people who, who want to speak on, and I'm one of them too. I would, I would love to speak on a TEDx stage. I just haven't yeah. figured out what that message is yet, but mm. uh, you know what, we, what I discovered in the last six months is that what I, where the direction I thought I was going is not the direction that I need to be going. So yeah, I've been on a journey. I, I, this podcast is 10 years old. Did you know that? I did not. <laughs> <laughs> this podcast is 10 years old. So I've been on a 10 year journey with this podcast. Wow. And, and the theme is the theme is the right theme. Gratitude yeah. Geek is the right theme. I just did. I was taking it in. I I thought it was taking me in a direction that that's not where I needed. It needed to be. I thought it was, I was going in a direction for business. And what really what I'm doing is I'm going in a business for inspiration to inspire mm. people to be grateful for the life that they have. Yeah. Um, but it's still, it is still a relationship marketing podcast. <laughs> <laughs> because, no, but I, because your relationships are everything, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. So. And I love that because we're seeing so much of that in the entrepreneur world right now where people are like, oh, I've been doing this for like 10 years, five years, whatever. And I think actually what I've been doing this whole time is this other thing. And I think that's where we're seeing a lot of the, the shifting that's happening right now in the industry. So I love that. Well, for the last, up until recently, everybody's been so fake. Yeah. You know, they were doing what they thought people wanted them to do. You know, they were just, but now we're like, okay, I'm done being fake. Although I've Nobody never been the energy fake. for it anymore. I I actually had, I was at a webinar last night and I got, I said something that was, I'm, I am real authentic 
and <laughs> I blurt, right? Yeah. And then after the after the meeting, I sent the the facilitator a text message and I said, you know, you're gonna learn that I just, you know, I have no filter. And uh, that's just who I am. And she goes, girl, you're great. <laughs> you know, Because I, you know, I'm just who I am. Because you know what? Sometimes I say the things that other people are thinking, mm-hmm. you know, and, but that's part of my cancer story, right? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm living with metastatic stage four cancer mm-hmm. and I have been for nine years, right? I know that my time on this planet is limited. So why do I need to waste time keeping my mouth shut yeah. when I have something to say? Absolutely. Right. And so, you know, even if you don't have cancer, you still have a limited time on this earth. So don't keep yeah. your mouth shut. When you have something to say, say it. Yeah. Because somebody needs to hear it. You're mm-hmm. you're going to say it and someone's going to hear it and they're going to be like, I needed to hear that. Mm-hmm. And right. probably you will have absolutely no idea who they are and it will not happen in the way that you think it will. And exactly. then suddenly something magical will happen. And that's the lucky part. Yeah, exactly. That's the lucky part. You know, you weren't lucky by not buying the lottery ticket. <laughs> <Keep reiterating this. laughs> you weren't lucky by not, you were lucky because you opened your mouth and somebody heard it. Yeah. You know, that's the lucky part. I love that. I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, what else do you want to talk about? Is there anything that we didn't talk about that you want to cover? Ooh, I mean, I think that we've covered it all pretty comprehensively, but we haven't I, talked okay. about your book either. Go oh, ahead. right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I was actually going to bring in. Okay. Um, something that I have been talking a lot about on the internet recently. Um, I'm uh, publishing my first book. So I've actually, I've written or edited 11 books for other people. And then I was like, I should probably do one of my own. Huh? Okay. And so I uh, put that together, but it's called use your words. And uh, it's a very small book about making very big change because in my non uh, internet work time, I do a lot of inmate advocacy. And so I see a lot of people in situations where they need, they need to have the power of their voice, but they don't know how to tap into that. And I was like, it's all just the same things we do in marketing. So I've written this book and it's whether you want to use it for business or advocacy, or just to learn how to use your words more powerfully and make some kind of change. It walks you through step-by-step everything that I do, both all the neuroscience stuff, all the art of writing, and then the literal like nuts and bolts. Here's how you put together any type of writing. So it's coming out on Substack. I'm actually publishing it as a serialized type thing uh, throughout uh, July and August, but it will absolutely be up when this podcast airs too. And I'd love people to check it out. So there'll be a link to that in the show notes. And so mm-hmm. that's um, Substack. Does that mean that it's an ebook? So it's um, I'm putting it out as like a sort of think like a very long form blog, but I'm also doing it there because I can have um, an audiobook version with it. So people will be able to listen to it as well. Oh, cool. I've yeah. never delved into Substack. I keep hearing about it, but I've never hung out there, checked it out or anything. I should probably check it out, huh? Well, you remember Medium, like what Medium yeah. was when it was first started? That's yeah. what Substack is now. Oh, so it just replaced Medium. Yeah, pretty Cause much. Because medium, medium got greedy and they wanted too much money. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I hope, I hope, see, there's me being negative again. Sorry. <laughs> Medium was a great resource when it started. Yeah. Kind of like Twitter was great when it started. You yeah. know, Facebook was great when it started. Now it's an ad every three times. You know, yeah. so, you know, things just evolve. Mm-hmm. And Stitcher, Stitcher was one of the very first podcast apps to listen to podcasts. And they are, they in 2023, they are shutting down. Oh, they oh, have no. shut down. Yeah, they they're they, they'll be shut down by the end of July of 2023. So they're mm-hmm. they're gone at this point. Um, mm-hmm. but they were at the forefront. But they they you know they they did their time, and now it's time for you know I I haven't used it, the Stitcher app since I found Good Pods. Yeah, Good Pods is. Do you love Good Pods? I it's my favorite. I, I haven't used it, but I've heard really good things. Oh my gosh, I love Good Pods because I can talk to other podcasters, mm-hmm. and when people comment or or like one of my episodes, I can say thank you. Oh, nice. You can't say thank you when someone listens to you on Apple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if somebody gives me five stars on Good Pods, I can say thank you for listening. Oh. Right? I really appreciate the listen. So yeah. I, it's a fabulous platform for pod, and, it, and it's got a great player too. So um, it's got all the, it's it's like social media for podcasting. It's great. Nice. It's great. Um, okay. So sub, tell me more about Substack because that's a tool that I yeah. don't know about. So um, it's, uh, um, let me think how I can encapsulate it. It started for long form um, blogging, uh, but it's also a little bit of an RSS feed too. So you, people can sign up and they'll they'll get notified every time you post something. They have podcasting capacities, um, you know, basic podcast capacities. So that's what I'll be doing for the audiobook. And then uh, the thing that I think other people might find useful that I'm not using is every time you publish something, they uh, generate social media graphics and captions and stuff for you out of it. So it's pretty easy if that's something that you just want to have happen for you. 
But um, yeah, that's the, that's the thing that makes it anything different than regular blogging. So if you don't have a website, you could create a sub stack as your yeah. blog. Yeah. That'd be very easy to do. Interesting. Mm-hmm. I'll have to check it out and see, yeah. what, see what's on there. I'll, well, I'll definitely check it out because I'll be sharing the links to your book. Yeah. And you know, serial books are how things started. The, um, the Green Mile, the book, the Green, the mm-hmm. Green Mile, that started off as a s- series of short stories. Oh, no way. Yeah. It was a, uh, yeah. And I mean, and same with, um, oh, lots of 19th century authors did the yeah. same thing. I'm trying to think of one that we would all know. I mean, um, all the Charles Dickenses, they came out as, as serialized ones, but, yeah. um, what's been fun too, is like seeing on Tumblr, they, uh, we all read Dracula, uh, every year as a serialized thing. And then I'm seeing a lot of other people. It's almost like it's got like zine feels to it, you know, where people are publishing serialized, uh, books and stories again. So I really enjoy it. Well, people take things in small chunks. Yeah. You know, it's when you listen to an audiobook, you, you listen to an, a snippet, right? Yeah. So I, th- I think it were, we went, uh, I think that the, the, uh, the attention rate of a, an average American is now six seconds. Mm. The attention span. Isn't that awful? It's very short. It's very short. So yeah, but you can't have a podcast in six seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so we need to wrap up. What is your favorite marketing tool tip or technique? Mm. So my tip is just a reminder that human is the only move left. The more you show up as you, the more things will, things will come to you. My secret Jedi mind trick that I share in all of my workshops and I'll share here. Um, so when you get to the end of anything, whether it's a podcast or a blog or a social media post or an email or a workshop or a whatever, make sure that you have a stupid clear call to action. And I mean something really, really, really crazy, like click here to see how to work with me. Uh, hit reply to this email and say hi, something like that. And the reason for that is when our brains get to the end of anything, brains are designed to conserve energy. So bring a little neuroscience back in right at the end. So designed to conserve energy. They don't want to think about what to do next. Cause if you have to think about what to do next, that takes energy and it's like, ah, so they go to the, e- the easiest thing. If there's no clear instruction, then it's like, no, shut it down, get rid of it, close the email, whatever. But if you get to the end of say a sales page and there's a very, very clear call to action, then your brain's like, Oh, I guess I clicked the button. Okay. And so it just, it's this nice little smoothing type of thing. So I call this Jedi mind trick because it will up your conversions like anything. And it is so simple. So just at the end of anything, very clear, very short call to action. How do you do that on a podcast? Um, whatever, whatever you want them to do, you know, rate me on good pods, come say hi, something like that, or, uh, make sure you click and read the show notes or whatever the thing is, just any kind of very simple next step instruction. Interesting. Okay. How do you do that in a social media post? Depends again on what you want them to do. Um, click, click the link in my bio to read the blog post, um, hit heart, uh, click the little airplane thingy. If you're on Instagram to send this to somebody and share it. Um, you know, it's just whatever you want them to do. That's a good them, call to action. Yeah. Hit the airplane to share this with someone you think would like to hear it. Yeah, or see exactly. It. I love that. Mm-hmm. Um, how do you feel about this? I've noticed on LinkedIn lately. Are you on LinkedIn? I am. Yeah. I've, I've noticed a lot of people like at the very end of their LinkedIn posts, of course, they're really long and I never yeah. read the whole thing, but <laughs> at the very bottom, there's like dots. And then it yeah. says, hi, I'm Candace and I help. I'm, I'm going to do mine. And I help solopreneurs uh, get stuff done. I, I don't know. Right. Um, book a 20 minute conversation with me at blah, blah, blah. How do you mm-hmm. feel about that? I think that it's fine if you don't overuse it because then that everything starts to feel like an advertisement. So right? not every post. Yeah. God, no, no, that would be so obnoxious and boring. Like if you're posting post to connect and then have the, the little call to action, say like one out of every three times, um, for like the salesy stuff, but even in your non-salesy post include some sort of call to action at the end of them of like, I'd really like to know what you think. Comment below. Let me know how you feel. Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Just like what do you, or even throw it off, throw it off base, have a post about something else. And then at the very bottom, what's your favorite ice cream? <laughs> I mean, that is good for engagement. <laughs> And then, but then you see, you can see who's paying attention. And then you see all these comments about ice cream flavors and you're like, what? <laughs> and then you go back and read. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. This is your moment of gratitude for whom or what are you most grateful? I am really grateful for the relationships that I've 
built um, in my past 15 years of doing this. That's what's, I mean, that's what's made it possible. That uh, has seen me through the the really, really hard times and also the really, really good times. So I am just deeply, deeply grateful for the people who came across me or we started talking and they were like, you know what? I think you can do this and I want to give you a chance. And um, I would not be here without that. Thanks for tuning in to Gratitude Geek, the relationship marketing podcast for micropreneurs building genuine lasting relationships with clients, colleagues, and community. Make sure to visit gratitudegeek.com for the show notes where you can find links to all the groovy resources we've mentioned, including ways to connect with our guest, Rachel Allen. If you've enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe and leave a review on Audible, iTunes, Good Pods, or your preferred podcast player. Our theme music is track 14 by Rev Brock and Soul Lily. I'm your host, Candice Tridardi, reminding you that gratitude is like manure. It's just a pile of poo until you spread it around. Stay groovy, my friends. Stay groovy, my friends. I know we can make it easier than they can. We can make it better than